Alright, bring it in. Right here. Do you know what say ho comes from? Do you know what oh yeah comes from? What throw your hands in the air comes from? Do you know who invented the scratch? You don't know, but you using all that and abusing the fact that you be using our raps and redoing our tracks and telling us our music is whack. I would never treat those that came before me like that. Cause if it wasn't for them, uh, if it wasn't for the Keith Cowboy, I, I recognize the fact that uh, if it wasn't for the treacherous three, I, uh, I recognize the fact that uh, if it wasn't for DJ Red Alert, I, oh, uh, I recognize the fact that uh, if it wasn't for the Scott LaRock, I recognize the fact that whack rap holds the whole crew back Cause everybody's stealing You take one step, they pulling you back Wheeling and dealing But we already been through that We know the feeling, y'all But when you diss your foundation, you really fall Cause you too are getting older, not younger You got to hear me, y'all Hip-hop is more than just how loud the people cheer me right here It's a continuation of over 30 years And without that if it wasn't for the T LeRock, I would I reckon This presentation is not gonna be like normal presentations you get in an academic environment. What is the difference? The difference is in our presentation we're dealing with live facts and effects, not studying dead material. KRS one <laughs> I want to spit some more of this so you can see the roar and roar from Chris. I really like to rock off the top to show you what's real hip hop, not the radio. Let me tell you right now, that's not the way to go. You gotta see right now what I'm saying, y'all. Me, I never did a bid, and if you did, you know you don't want that for your kid. <laughs> Let me tell you right now, I'm in defiance. Stop the violence. Welcome to another hip hop study session. I am KRS One. How many real hip hoppers? How many real hip hoppers in the place right about now? The true history of hip hop begins with a collection of legends, proclamations, myths, and stories, important dates, and memorable moments. These are the real ingredients of any history. But when it comes to hip-hop and its real history, the actual founders and architects of original hip-hop are always left out. This is why the temple of hip-hop exists, and this presentation is before you now. Everyone is entitled to their opinions and theories and experiences with hip-hop. But as authentic hip-hop scholars, you must have the facts. This presentation is all about the facts. The facts regarding hip-hop from out of the mouths of those that actually created hip-hop. Now people say you should make the record that sell. Some say you make the record that rock the house well. I'm with that pro from up temple of the slow and but it gotta be real because I know who I am. And inside of me, I could not see hurting all of my people for some M-O-N-E. Why should I have to stoop to that level? Kicking negativity and I'm a rebel to the devil. I can pump it like a can and kick it like a champ and get the pot of gold, three wishes and the lamb and come right back and rule with a sequel. Never seen a man have so much love for his people. But some black artists try their hardest to make a crossover jam, but the fans aren't smartest. Cause they be peeping it while the artists be creeping it. To the pop fans for the money and sleeping. But it's only but so many drinks you could try. Till you drink all your water until your well runs dry. And there's nothing the matter with shattering racism. Just be you and don't try to be him. Cause it's too much knee bending, too much foot shuffling, too much booty kissing, love of self listen, eating black people up just like cancer. And all of the symptoms, now here's some answers. Take care of the mental and physical health and spiritually learn to love yourself and once you do that and see that it's true learn a lot of people who look like you
Historically, hip hop began in New York on August 11, 1973, at approximately 9 p.m. in a community recreation center at 1520 Sedgwick Avenue on the west side of the Bronx. At the request of his sister Cindy, then known as Pep, a graffiti writer and b-boy from Jamaica, who would eventually be known as Cool DJ Herc, introduced the principles of Jamaican-style DJ into the people of the Bronx. Way back in the days when hip-hop began, the Coco Rock, Cool Herc, Breaking or breakdancing, MCing or rap, graffiti writing or graffiti art, DJing, cutting, mixing, scratching. It started there when we only perceived ourselves as a music genre, as an art form. But as we got older, we realized that that art form comes from somewhere. And we began to interpret our consciousness. Then we added on beatboxing street fashion, street language, street knowledge, and street entrepreneurialism. Because we realized that in order to live hip-hop, we were going to have to deal with the totality of who we are as a people. Hip-hop is a new nation. Hip-hop is a new civilization upon the earth. Coochies was about to break up. Yo. I had a lot. I was like, yo, Chris, man, what you think we should do, man? He was like, yo, it's a test of your skills, man. Remember that? Yeah. <laughs> yo, KLS1 and weighs a ton. Freak cheese suck, and I'm a son of a gun. Black master of Vicky Trade under the sun. Talk short like razor blades under the tongue. Get up, path and come. Get the captain up. Trying to breathe like Chris. Collapse your lung, yo, chump. You can choke from the web I spun. I done cleared them out, the threat I brought. What? You done heard about what said I'm from, my nigga. Word about new rule of thumb. Y'all better bow down, hear the ruler come. I'm a legend in the hood, not a who to love. Oh, I thought, yeah. put it down, confusing some of y'all. What a key for, gotta do with a drum and all. School uh. on stage like I'm doing a seminar. Rocking on a mic up in here with a women all. Me and Chris, and it goes like this. Black on a model Philly with the SP twist. Yeah, I'm saying in the place to the trouble and bass. Put your hands up. Get your hands up, check it out, y'all. Hip hop is a new civilization because we've realized how to transcend the divisions in humanity. Race, ethnicity, class, religion. We figured out how to all come together. That's a civilization. We should never regard ourselves as just a music genre. Although that's powerful and, and positive, that's not all of who we are. We are a nation. We are a culture, a world culture. We are a civilization. Hip-hop's true history cannot be properly documented without an understanding of hip-hop's true origin. Who really knows what it is? 
and you, you start to realize who didn't know what it is. And then they try to make it cool to not know what it is. That's, that's foul. That's self-destruction. <clears throat> like, if you say, oh, it's cool, I don't know who them, them, them niggas is. No, how stupid that is in music. Like, Bob Dylan's never going to say he don't know Money Waters. He don't know B.B. King. He don't know uh, uh, Johnny or whatever. Yeah. He, he, he's going to be like, well, I got the music because he's... When you listen to Donny Hathaway album, at the end he's like, what are you going to do, Donny Hathaway, after you finish this tour? Well, I'm going to go back to school and study music. Oh. That's another dude. If you say that, I'm like, this is the music industry. So the reason that cats don't excel that much is because they still think and they catching on to something that's the thing that make money now. It's the hustle. So when I said hip-hop is dead, they don't even know what hip-hop is. Even some of these dudes with platinum records don't even know what hip-hop is. I would be ashamed if I played rock and roll classical music and didn't know Mozart. They don't even know how stupid they look when they go, I don't know who that is. Who is Busy B? The fact that you don't go and learn mm. means you're a fucking idiot. Real talk. Come on. I say two, four, six, eight. A love thug if you with me, don't hit the stage. Uh, where people know that there's a legitimate force out there that is uh, ran by legitimate people about this culture. If you have questions about the culture and you want legitimate answers, not yo man, you know what I'm saying, but legitimate answers that you can go and print somewhere in a college journal about a culture, uh, you need to come see the Temple of Hip Hop. Uh, we have certified uh, specialists. Pee Wee Dance is a hip hop historian. He's, he'll be here tonight. Hopefully we can get a little interview with him as well. Cool Herc, the father of hip hop, uh, is our resident scholar as well. As rap music became more commercialized and mainstream, we began forming our unique body of hip hop knowledge with hip hop's actual founders in an effort to preserve such knowledge for future hip hop scholars. For most people, the very term hip-hop scholar was seen as a contradiction, but these are some of the earliest images of hip-hop's actual founders teaching the origins of hip-hop in a legitimate learning environment again for the first time. Well, it started for myself. <laughs> I was the first, I was, uh, hip-hop to me right now is like on the course of a, uh, a relay. I was the first guy who started off with the baton. You know, I started off like that, and um, my, the origin was still in background. <laughs> you know, I was born in the West Indies, from Jamaica, Kingston, Jamaica. So it was it was an opportunity to go to go to London. My parents were my way from uh, Jamaica to the States or London, so you know she chose. The United States, and that's where, as far as where hip hop could have started from, because from the UK or Canada, but it started it in New York on the West Side in the Bronx. And um, but little did anybody know, myself know, it was going to have a form like this. It would have spread like a ripple in the river from state to state and from country to country. And before we know it, hip hop is for culture. Listen. I tell you what I give, the mic is going off and on, listen kid, I used to sleep right on that bridge, see the people looking up there with their kids, see that shit there, that's called the Brooklyn Bridge over there, and that bridge is called the Manhattan, and that bridge there started my rapping, that's Queens Bridge, <laughs> and you know what it is, <laughs> Let me take y'all back, all the way back. This is MC and I rap. And while I'm rapping from heaven, oh, I ain't gonna say that about Hot 97. Now fuck it, let me continue to truck it. KRS one drops the bucket. Oh, let me come back. You right there, you recording all that? Let me talk to my kids in 2023 so they can really see an MC. That's your ancestors. Look at them. That's your uh, ancestors. The fans of hip hop and the two pioneers, you know, and our brothers that you know 
came from the whole genesis of the thing, you know? Um, because what, who the people that's organizing it right now are really like more or less the media and record company execs. You know, so therefore they're making it what they want it to be and what they want it to be is what they know they can sell. As the years rolled on and rap music became more corporate, many of us refused to allow all of hip hop to be commercialized. This made us and our work underground. Really, hip hop has been existing for a long time on the underground level. Being underground in the 1990s simply meant standing for something. Hip hoppers with entrepreneurial spirits flourished during these times. And, you know, brothers used to come in and just buy the tapes as we was making them. We used to copy them as the parties was going on and sell them then. And then I played there for a year. After that, I started selling them on my own on the street corner. And they blew up. As we became wiser, we realized that hip-hop is the only thing of value that we actually own. Collectively, hip-hop is actually ours. It is the only subject that we know to be actually true. Even though we might not know one another, we feel one another. And this is called culture. Uh, happened with two turntables and a mixer, man. And it just, just started to migrate. The people just started to pick up the feeling. It was something that we weren't accepted at, at, at disco joints and, and popular places. So we had to just make our own culture, man. You know what I mean? It was, it was hard times. It was, it was just something that came out of just, just total freedom, man. You know what I mean? And and and, and just, and just expressing this. You know what I mean? And, and just, and just trying to make a negative into a positive. And look at it now, 30 years later. Who would have known, right? Long before anyone was thinking about hip hop's actual preservation, or hip hop as an educational tool, or hip hop's spiritual power, or even its potential political power. Serious hip-hop activists were meeting regularly to develop plans for hip-hop's actual preservation and further development. This is how and why people even know about hip-hop today. It is because of meetings like these in the early 1990s where we would get together and ask the founders and pioneers of original hip-hop important questions such as... What in our minds is the most important aspect to preserving the culture? of hip hop. I just, it was given to me, they said, yo, keep it going, preserve this state of mind. That's what we're trying to get. And if, damn, that's, it's going to take a while to figure out what that state of mind is. Oh, oh, yeah, and this is, I'm glad you said but that. But this is a whole new organization. I mean, it all stems from hip hop, and we all know what BAM stands for, peace, unity, love, and having fun. Oh, through yeah. economics and all that. Yeah. You got to take hip hop for what it is. You got to recognize that this hip hop, there's the electro funk, there's the go go, there's the new jack swing, there's the gangster, what you call gangster rap, there's the sweet mellow like right. uh, Jazzy Jeff and Fresh Prince. We got to take all the styles of hip hop and recognize them all. We can't be having that bickering, oh, the hell with the West Coast, hell with down south, um, hell with New Orleans, like Arrested Devote, hammers not this, hammer not that. You know, we got to get away from foolishness because we are fighting for the minds of all our people right. throughout the world. We got to open up. We have to understand what it means when we do something, like this brother said about his job. Now, if, if we're going to build, you know, what we're really doing is building a society, and part of society is, ha is what, what's wrong right now is we're lo we have no spirituality. So we have to bring spirituality back in effect. And once you have spirituality and you become strong within yourself, then you can define what is going to happen in your life. Preserving hip-hop, I mean, I believe, is getting people to find esteem in hip-hop. I've been teaching public schools for the last four years. Mm. And the one thing I noticed in teaching social studies is that the kids didn't see their immediate society as worth something studied. Mm. So things that I would do is I would say, okay, we're going to study hip-hop. Hip-hop is a society of people. You interact with one another. We're going to study the ways in which, you, the ways in which your society manifests itself. The, stop, the dance, the music, the hairstyles, the clothes, the fashion. Then I flipped it and said, well, let's see who makes money off of it. And I started bringing magazines in. I bought the Word Up in and the, and the Rap Masters. Then I bought the Source in and the Vibe. And as we got higher in levels of, of getting across messages, we saw where m the m most money was going. I said, well, why is that? You know, we have to start seeing our community 
as something to have esteem in. In doing that, we define it. Like, art needs to be seen, you know what I'm saying? We gotta get back to the regional cultural and that mentality of the whole art form. Once we get everybody culturally based, then we can move. But right now, we're not treating it as a culture, we're treating it as a commodity. Mm. And when you treat it as a commodity, you're gonna lose it. And we got to have a whole accountable discipline order and the formulator union, and we got to put our money where our mouth is and be doers of the words. Through his organization, Zulu Nation, Africa Bambada would end many of the gang rivalries in New York and teach the combined principles of peace, love, unity, and safely having fun as the fundamental basis for the existence and practice of hip hop, which also included knowledge and overstanding. With overstanding, hip hop was able to further develop and give rise to Grandmaster Flash, who would manipulate the DJ mixer and turntable to introduce the arts of cutting and scratching in 1976. Uh, this is where I came into the game. Now, with my scientists, to every good record, there's a great part. So what I had to do is figure out a way to take this teeny tiny section where it only broke down for like maybe 30 seconds and extend it to four or five or six minutes. Uh, it took a lot of, of figuring out how needles work, how does a torque of a turntable work? The state of inertia, so all the way up to speed. Uh, the type of needles, elliptical versus conical, the size, the grams, the tracking. Uh, once I was able to figure all that out, I had to figure out a way to take this section and just repeat it over and over and over again. It was a two year period in my mother's house, uh, straight from school or straight from work. Uh, and coming up with this science. And coming up with it, I'll never forget when I first displayed it in the parks, I said to myself, well, I'm playing the most climatic part of these records. So if I can figure out a way to just keep playing them one after another without you being able to tell, I'm gonna have you going crazy. So, like, yeah, okay. so when I went up in the park and I tried this, I did this, the audience was doing exactly what you're doing. Uh, at that point in time, I felt quite discouraged. Let me tell you why. I'm saying to myself, I'm playing these, 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 these passages of music. I'm going right to the meat of the sandwich. The break of this record to the break of this record on time, one after another. And Nobody's going berserk, nobody's going nuts. It's like nobody's, no asses is wiggling, any children in here, hope not. Uh, nobody's moving. Um, to my dismay, I figured out uh, that I needed some sort of vocal entertainment. God bless the dead cowboy. I would have to say, my first MC cowboy, he probably was the one person who kept my spirits up. Because me doing this would help the vocal entertainment, the emceeing, I might have given up. I might have said, uh, you know, I was hearing things like, what is this ridiculous fucking noise this guy's doing with these records? You know, you know, I heard this record before, and why is it that he keeps going back to the same part over and over and over and over and over and over, and over again? This guy, he's stupid, he's an idiot, he's like losing his mind, he's whatever, whatever, you know. Once myself and Cowboy came up with a science because he was like a ringmaster or a Simon Says type of person. He was able to get people to be occupied. He was like the guy that would just get people off of me, which is what I needed. And once that happened, it was on. From there, I started going into clubs. And I'll just end it here when I go into a long story. I'm going to the clubs and ask DJs, can I get on for four or five minutes? Um, these jocks would be like, you know, the fuck out of here, you know. <laughs> You're going to scratch up the records. When in actuality, when you are queuing, you are scratching the record back anyway. The only difference is you just push it out to the people. So they, their ignorance was their problem. But it wasn't until I met a gentleman by the name of DJ Hollywood in Club 371. He let me get on. And then I went to a club called Disco Fever. And there was a fellow by the name of Junebug. 
he let me on. So the other other clubs, eventually, they had to let me on because people wanted to see that. And uh, that's what my contribution to this game is. Thank you. When Love Bug stars the Chief Rock the Busy B and others like Keith Cowboy from The Furious Five began to popularize the word hip hop in the late 1970s, everyone knew what they were talking about. No one had to explain what hip hop was because we were all it. The language, the clothing, the jewelry, the music, the art, the dances, all of it was us. It was who we were as a people. None of this needed to be explained. It was all felt. Hip hop as a culture is a beautiful thing that was created from nothing. You know, it was like, we gonna give you nothing and the ghetto just said, well, we're gonna, we're gonna appreciate what we can do. You know, we can dance and we're gonna make them kids into heroes. You know, we can paint on the wall and we're gonna make these kids into heroes. And we started to create our own stars. The, me the media didn't accept us, but we made our own stars. You were like stars in the neighborhood. And the only other way to get a star in the neighborhood at that time was being a gang. Be, be so negative that you became a star. But hip hop was like a positive way to be a star. Mm. You know, you know, if you were the best break dancer, you you had you had fans. You know, even if it's only from your own projects. You know, if you were a good DJ, you had fans. You could say, hey, I'ma be in this one place and people will come. All there is to see. A call to go back to the essence. It's a lot to learn, so I study my lesson. I thought the ghetto was the worst that could happen to me. I'm glad I listened when my father was rapping to me. Cause back in the days they lived in caves. When hip hop was being done for fun and popularity, young street poets began organizing themselves into DJ and MC and crews. One such crew, called the Cold Crush Brothers, were among the first to vocalize hip hop's culture, introducing the art of MCing, and presented some of the first rap lyrics ever into hip hop. From 1973 to 1979, hip hop was practiced as a way of life. Breaking, emceeing, aerosol art, and DJing were done to enhance one's peace, love, unity, and joy. But in 1979, hip hop's culture split when Grandmaster Kaz's manager, Big Bank Hank, recited Kaz's rhymes for his part in the now classic song, Rapper's Delight. Grandmaster Kaz puts it this way. Basically, Hank, I met Hank at the club he was bouncing at, Sparkle Hip Hop Club in the Bronx. And um, I just, I used to go there and see other hip hop acts there when I wasn't performing. And me and Hank was kicking at the door. Um, this was at a time when a guy named Ray Chandler, who was like managing um, Grandmaster Flash and, and, and the Furious Fives, he was 
he, he was getting them booked in every high school around the city. He was getting them booked in clubs and this and that. And I didn't have nobody representing my crew. I didn't have nobody that could go in somewhere and say, well, listen, look, I represent so-and-so and we want, you know, this and that. So I thought Hank could be that dude for me, you know, because just from our, our conversations we had at the door. So he, he became like acting manager for my group. So he took out a loan, $2,000 from his parents, okay? And, 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 and to, to buy us more equipment, bigger equipment, got bigger speakers made, and bought amps and stuff like that for the crew. Because hip hop was still in that stage at the time. It was still, when you had a party, you brought your whole set. You had to have your own equipment. Right, you had to have your own equipment. It didn't happen until later people start playing on other people's sets. So. We wasn't gonna make no pay back no two thousand dollar loan on no hip hop jams. Right. You know, it, it wasn't happening. Right. Not we wasn't getting that kind of money. So Hank got a job in a pizza shop in New Jersey. The people from Sugar Hill or whatever, her sons and stuff, they looking for people to, to get on this record that their mom is, is starting to she's gonna put it, make a record. He goes out in the pizza shop, he got dough on him and all that, he get in the car and he starts saying my rhymes and stuff to the dude in the car, J Joey Robinson, right? So they like, okay, hey, you're down. So Hank passes the audition, whatever, okay? Comes to me later on, he's like, yo, Kaz, listen, um, these people want me to make a record. I'm like, what? A record for what? What, you know? Yo, the, um, this, this lady, she, she's, she's, you know, starting the label, and she wanted to make a rap record, and she got two guys, and she, you know, she wanted me to be the third. She wanted to be three of them. And I'm like, what? You, you don't even MC. You don't rap. What you gonna do? He was like, well, yo, I'm gonna say some of your rhymes. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's why I say, here it come. <laughs> so I'm like, first of all, anybody who would make a record and ask him to be on it, it can't be nobody in their right mind, all right? <laughs> it can't be no real record. It can't really be going nowhere, okay? And then my second thought is, well, why you didn't tell him about me? Right. You my manager. If, if, if somebody wants you to make a record and you, the, you my manager, <laughs> you won't get in the car and start saying my stuff. Two months later, Two months later, now this is the boombox days. This is the when everybody walking down the street got a big ass radio on their shoulder, okay? Every station you turned on was playing Rapper's Delight, was playing this song. Now me, I don't got people around me saying, yo, you need a lawyer, you need to go do this and that, there's copyright, this and that, there's a royal, there's this, nobody around me knew nothing like that. We wasn't in the industry, we was in hip hop. We wasn't in the music business. And I... Still waiting. No, no, I'm not even waiting. I'm not waiting for nothing from them because mine is gonna come from me deserving it. That's what I feel like. And it, and, you know, it was the very success of rap music that made anyone believe that they too could be a rapper, a breaker, a graffiti writer, or a DJ, simply by hearing or looking at what hip hop's original architects were doing and mimicking them. And another thing about it is you could study hip hop right now and still meet the people who made history. All these people aren't dead. You can meet philosophers like Nas. You can meet philosophers like KRS-One. You can talk to Ice Cube. They, we're still walking around and breathing. Uh-huh. All right, bring it in. Right here. Do you know what say ho comes from? Do you know what oh yeah comes from? What throw your hands in the air comes from? Do you know who invented the scratch? You don't know, but you using all that and abusing the fact that you be using our raps and redoing our tracks and telling us our music is whack. I would never treat those that came before me like that. Cause if it wasn't for them, if it wasn't for the Keith Cowboy, I recognize the fact that if it wasn't for the treacherous three, uh, I recognize the fact that if it wasn't for DJ Red Alert, oh, uh, I recognize the fact that if it wasn't for the Scott LaRock, uh, I recognize.
recognize the fact that whack rap holds the whole crew back. Cause everybody's stealing. You take one step, they pulling you back, wheeling and dealing. But we already been.